May we just come together with singing and being celebration our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The passage of scripture I'd like you to open up with is Second uh, Timothy chapter one verses six to seven. Five to seven, sorry. In this passage we see Paul telling Timothy how important his ancestors are. His uh, grandmother and his mother because of today's Mother's Day. So how wonderful it is. And to me, that's wonderful because when I became a believer through my grandmother's Bible, how the Holy Spirit brought it to me and I started reading it and the Holy Spirit convicted me of how much I need Jesus Christ. And may it be with each one of us. When I recall to remember the genuine faith that is it in you, Timothy, which you dwell first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, I'm persuaded is that it's in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gifts of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. How wonderful it is to have a sound mind and to know that we are in Jesus and he's in us. Father in heaven, as we gather together in the name of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, may we just rejoice and as, a, as a men and women lead us in singing, playing the piano and, and the trumpet and the guitar and the music that we sing and the word we have to our interim pastor Larry uh, that uh, just touch our hearts and fill us with joy for Jesus Christ, we ask in his precious name. Amen. Well, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, thankful for, I, I loved that presentation by House of Grace. I just thought uh, how important that area of support ministry is for people in times of transition and crisis and an alternative uh, to so often some of the, the more tragic responses to issues of, of birth and life. And, uh, and I am happy to have my wife, Audrey, is along with me and will be with me over the season that I'm here. And uh, today, uh, for Mother's Day, uh, our daughter, Lorene, and her husband, Nick, from Vancouver, came over and are, are spending the weekend with us. So I uh, dragged them out of bed early uh, to come down the, down the road here. Uh, it's been almost a year. We moved here, Audrey and I, from uh, Alberta to, uh, to Souk, where we live, and uh, a, much, a much gentler winter, I want to say. Uh, we we uh, wish there was a little less rain, but, <laughs> but I don't have to shovel it, and that's kind of a nice feature as well. So we're, we're enjoying that. Uh, uh, I retired after 41 years of uh, ministry, and uh, so looked at the opportunity when uh, Pastor Gordon uh, McCann called and said, uh, would you like to do a little bit of uh, supply here in Duncan? And uh, uh, said, yeah, I think that would be uh, fitting. We'd uh, enjoy doing that. And so for the next period of time, I'll have an opportunity to, to be here with you. I look forward to getting to know you a little bit better, knowing what your stories are and having an opportunity to maybe uh, together uh, be a part of this journey. So uh, your DS has told me he thinks by the summer uh, he'll have a, a pastor to come in, and uh, although I get a feeling, uh, you know, pa uh, uh, filling the shoes for Pastor Wayne is going to be a very uh, big thing to, to fit. Did you call him Pastor Wayne or Pastor Lee? Pastor Wayne. That seems natural. Anyways, along the way. So Now, Gordon didn't tell me which summer it was that he was thinking of this, so I'm... <laughs> Kind of hoping it's this summer, uh, but anyways, we'll look forward to being a part of that journey together, and uh, uh, just want to say as well, as you shared these prayer concerns, I love the fact that you have an understanding and an awareness of people in your communities in times of need, and uh, my privilege often as a pastor is having a chance to just come alongside of people in providing some support, some encouragement, and some presence of God in the midst of their journey, so uh, if it ever seems to you like it might be appropriate to uh, have me come and do a visit, maybe if somebody's in hospital or in a time of transition and they're open to it, I'd be happy to do that. And the same for any of you. Please let me know. Uh, Julia will give, make sure you have my email address and I'd be uh, happy to help and support in that particular very uh, critical area of pastoral work. That's a uh, part of 
what I uh, have agreed to do as well, and I'm looking forward to that. So it is Mother's Day. I love this day. It is so critical and important and valuable to us uh, to honor our moms. I will let you know at the end of the, my message, I will take some time and I want to pray for the moms who are here and uh, to represent them along the way. Um, we lost my mom a few years ago. She, she's a hero of mine. At the age of 28, she was widowed, had four kids and one on the way. And uh, she raised us uh, and, and just uh, showed to us uh, courage in so many things in so many ways along the way. So I do, I do value that. Um, motherhood, of course, begins uh, with a decision someplace along the way uh, that we're going to have a child. And I picture in my mind some young, young girl. Imagine this, if somebody you know comes, comes before you and uh, she stands there and, and uh, she's bright and energetic and uh, uh, she, um, uh, she stands there dressed in a trim-fitting, dry-clean, two-piece matching suit, her fingernails manicured and stylish, her hair tinted uh, to perfection and beauty, and she's the picture of the modern businesswoman. And uh, she's, she's built a place for her in, in, uh, in an area of work and business. She's, uh, she's uh, certainly uh, worked and thrived on new challenges. She's married the man of her dreams. She drives the car she loves. Uh, they go on vacation a couple of times a year to far off distant places on a whim. They'll head off to the mountains to go hiking or snowboarding or uh, any of those kinds of things. Uh, maybe do a new production down in the, in the uh, Belfry Theater in Victoria. And, and she's standing there in the midst of all of this health and vigor and energy and her eyes are bright and she says to you, we've decided to have children. What do you think? <laughs> now, a part of me wants to say, do you know what you're wanting to launch into here? You know, this could uh, upset your well-manicured life in so many ways. I, I might want to I might want to say to her and her husband, you should watch a few of those birthing videos, you know, just so you know how, how agonizing, messy, and difficult those kind of things are. I remember when our son was born, our, our, our oldest, the first kid that we had along the way, and I said to Audrey right after, we're not doing this again. <laughs> how we ended up with two other kids, well, anyhow, uh, but it's just it's that way. I, I, I might want to say to her, you know, bringing into a child into this world is going to change everything that you have ever had. And, and one of the things you don't realize is, is it will engage your heart in a way that you have never realized before. One writer put it this way, making the decision to have a child, it's sometimes like a decision to forever have your heart go walking out in the world, outside of your body. And, and, and those of you who are mothers know that it's, it's, a, it's not a matter of how old the kids get uh, and what they accomplish in life because all of that time when you give birth to them, your heart seems to be out there forever, like a target for every fearful thing they, they do, every questioning choice they make. I, I might be tempted to, to, to just let her know that... Uh, when it's just the two of you, it's easy and natural to build around all of the things that you have. You, all, you, you can have all sorts of wonderful treasures that you collect. The, the art you have, the car you drive, the clothes you wear. The, the, the space and place that you have is yours to do. You lay out the bathroom exactly how you want it. The living room is full of very valuable furnishings. No one to compete for space or time. And all of that, all it's going to take when you're a parent is one little scream from the other room from your child. You'll drop that piece of crystal in no time. Uh, and you'll run to see what it is is their problem. You, you won't think about what am I dressed like? What does my appointment calendar say? If there is a need and an urgency, you're going to respond to, to that child above all other things. I might be, want to say to her, you know, it could be professional suicide to you. All of the stuff you've done for the getting to where you are, no matter how much time, effort, blood, sweat, tears, you've invested in your career. You're going to be in some meeting someplace, and your mind's going to go to that child. And, and it doesn't matter how important the spreadsheets and the graphs and all of that are, you're, you're going to be thinking about that. You go on some road trip, and the office is paying for it, and they, they, they put you in a, in, a, in a beautiful hotel, rimmed in cherry wood and three-inch carpets, and your only thought's going to be about the nursery and, and diapers and the smell of clothing and all of those things. Nothing is as important as that child. 
I should let her know, I, I think I should let her know that, that uh, you know, this man that she married, uh, she married him because he was looking good and he made her feel good. And she married him because he makes her laugh and he works hard and, and uh, they work together well. I said, when, when they share a child together, all the stuff that meant something before, the physique and, the, and, and all of those things that captured her, she now loves him instead by watching him as he diapers their baby, as he ch uh, cares for their child, as she looks after this new addition in their world. Those of us who have been through this would really want to let them know the huge changes that are going to come into your life can be tough sometimes, painful. Burdens that you cannot even imagine. And some of you could tell me stories I know. But I don't say that. You wouldn't say that. <laughs> you just say, that's the greatest news. Uh, we're so happy for it. You, you'll never regret it. Are we lying? No. Not at all. In, in fact, we understand that the burdens, the tough times, the... The passages that we go through with children that are all of those things are just a part as well of the blessings and that there are compensations that come to us in just understanding the importance of family. On this day when we celebrate and applaud mothers, there's an interesting verse and passage of scripture in Isaiah chapter 49 where, where the skeptics around Isaiah are, are, are skeptical that God would ever be merciful. It seems to us that he's just, just simply judgmental. And so Isaiah gives this, what almost seems like a ludicrous claim. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion for the child that she has born? Though she might forget. I will not forget. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. For Isaiah, it's a way of saying, uh, it, as, as unbelievable it is, as it is to think of a mother with no compassion for her child, God is like that. There's a, there's a grim story in Scripture. But, but to me, it, it, uh, and, I, and I thought, do you want to tell that story? Uh, Mother's Day. But, but you know, Mother's Day, Mother's stories sometimes aren't always coached either in sweetness and goodness and gentleness and neatness. It's messy. It's painful. It's full sometimes of the agonies. As I appreciate it that somebody said, let's pray as well for mothers who have lost children. I've, I've been at the graveside many times with those families who have had to bury a child and there's just no forgetting it. Of oh, getting over it. In, in 2 Samuel chapter 21, there is the story of Rizpah. Now, Rizpah was one of Saul's concubines. Concubine was a wife, but uh, not a wife. She, uh, she ca came into the marriage without a dowry, and so she didn't have all of the rights and the privileges that, uh, that a real wife would have. But she bore Saul two sons. And as chapter 21 opens up, Saul is dead. David is king. There's a terrible famine in the land, and for three years they've had no rain. David sees in this something of God's hand, and so he comes before the Lord and, and, and uh, uh, pauses and, and reflects and, and waits and listens, and the Lord reveals to David that the famine is a part of a punishment for Saul. In, in the downward spiral in some of Saul's reign, a time had come when he had put to death the men of Gibeon. Now, a little context here. 400 years before Saul, when Joshua brought the children of Israel into the promised land that God gave them, they came into this place, and there were the Gibeonites who were there, and they established an agreement. They made a pledge and a promise to the Gibeonites as they took over their land to say, we will always protect you. And, and so Saul, someplace along the way, decided that they were a threat, and so he executed them all. Genocide. And, and it was the blood of innocent people 
that brought God to a place of saying there needs to be some payment. Uh, I think when I read papers today, hear the news today, I don't think I think it's it's important for leaders in our world to understand God understands injustice, and He will find a way uh, to bring punishment for that. So so David David is burdened by this, and he calls the Gibeonites who are survivors. Uh, to come into his presence and he, and he wants to make amends for what Saul has done. Now, in hindsight, I think David would have probably been better off if he had said, let me give you some land. Let me provide you with some, a, a bonus, even an apology of sorts. Instead, he asks him, what do you want? And their, res their, res their response is simple but very brutal. They say, give us seven of Saul's descendants, that we might hang them and disgrace them. And they said, then we'll be satisfied. So David does that. And two of those men were Rizpah's sons. And here's what it says. He handed them over to the Gibeonites who killed them and exposed them on the hill before the Lord. And all seven of them fell together and they were put to death during the first days of the harvest, and just as the barley harvest was beginning, Rizpah, daughter of Ahi, took sackcloth and spread it out for herself on a rock, and from the beginning of the harvest till the rains poured down from the heavens on the bodies, she did not let the birds of the air touch them or the wild animals by night. It's a horrible story. But in the midst of that whole story, arises for us some of the qualities that are so important for us in life that come from mothers. As I reflected on it, I thought certainly one of them has to be the, the, the blessing of presence. Now, Rudyard Kipling read this story in 2 Samuel and wrote these words as a part of a poem, If I were hanged on the highest hill, mother o' oh mine, mother o' oh mine, I know whose love would follow me still, mother o' oh mine, mother o' oh mine. There is nothing about mothers that makes us uh, feel like we don't need to have them around. I remember as a kid, uh, you know, coming home from school and, uh, and my mom uh, worked when she could as a nurse's aide and, and stuff like that. And I'd come home and I'd open the door and I'd say, call out her name, mom, you here? And if she called from the back, I, I didn't, not that I had anything to say to her, not that I wanted anything to do. I just needed to know she was there. And somehow it was just better if she was home. Presence means a world of a difference. The power of a mother's presence can never be misunderstood or, or never really understood until it's gone. And for some of you, that's the case, having lost the opportunity to just be present with them. And the scripture in Isaiah reminds us that those who never get this presence in life, either because it wasn't there or because the support wasn't warm and supportive, God provides that. He won't forget. He will care and remember us. The blessing of presence is a reminder that the toughest part sometimes of motherhood isn't just giving birth, it's showing up every day and being there all of the time. Understand, I, I might be the only person this kid has. Rizpah was a foreshadowing, I think, of another woman who one day would come to a hillside and watch her son die. We think of Mary who comes to, to Golgotha and watches her son as he breathes out his last on the cross. She was present, it was difficult, it was painful. Helpless to do anything but be there. There's, there's the blessing of patience. Now, patience might be defined as a long trust in the same direction. A belief that in time, answers will come, God will work. Motherhood contains within it everything I think that would dry up patience. Uh, you know, and, and sometimes we see it on display, don't we? You know, in the grocery store. I watched it yesterday. We were 
getting something and some poor you know, little kid brings his juice box of uh, sweet stuff that he wants and he puts it in the, uh, in the basket. And the mom said, I think I made it really clear we're not getting this. <laughs> and then there's this case and I just think, oh, how do you put up with all of that? Um, but she just endured, kept on with it. And I think about that as well. You know, it's almost like somebody said, motherhood is like uh, we're being at a place where the boss tells you that you have to meet the needs of every customer who walks through the door of the store day after day, no pay, no holidays, no bonuses, whatever they want, glass of water, a book, a different outfit, it's your job to get it for them. And then, uh, you, you, you know, you, you have to do a wet clean being called on aisle five and a screaming kid at till number two and, and all of the time that that's going on, you just need to find, you just need to go to the bathroom. And then when you get to the bathroom, you hear through the door, you know, that there's a fight going on in one of the bedrooms and the, and the baby's eating one of the plants. And, and uh, in, in those moments, patience is, is trusting God's going to make it all worth it. There's a blessing that mothers bring of possibilities. Every parent has high hopes and dreams and aspirations for their children. It's in our nature to want them to rise to heights and to accomplish much. But to give the blessing of possibility also means there is the risk of failure. From the moment you teach your toddler to walk and then ride a bike, uh, and then go someplace on their own, you set them up with the risk of failing and falling short. It's important to remember failure is not final. It is, in fact, inevitable. Before they walk and run, they're going to fall and hurt themselves. When they begin to ride that bike, they'll crash and scrape elbows and knees. Before they successfully venture out, they will face fear and uncertainty. But through it all, there's the importance of knowing that behind them, there's somebody who believes in them and their possibilities. How do you do that? Somebody said this, you must be willing for God to do whatever he wants to do in you, to make you the person that you need to be, to feed into another's life the possibilities that are there for them. Those who have lost a child tell me that one of the truly most painful parts is it's also a loss of what might have been, but will not be. That must have been what, a part of the agonizing journey here for Rizpa. On that hillside, as she chased away the wild animals and the birds, I wonder how it meant her, f how, it meant her how she felt she thought a bit about what might have been. I wonder about Mary who came to that hillside and looked at Jesus beaten and bleeding and dying on the cross, surrounded by those who hated him. And uh, remembering that time when she was promised by an angel that she would conceive a child, that he would be named Jesus, the night of his birth, the celebration of the angels, the coming of the shepherds, the visit of royalty, and all the way through those things, the message on her heart that he had come to deliver his people. Through her life, I'm sure she must have questioned at times the road that he took and the things that he said. And <coughs> but always, I am certain, she believed in this. He was going to do what God had called him to do. There's the blessing of protection. Psalm 91 gives a very a great glimpse of God. Being like a mother hen that gathers its chicks under its wings. And again, there's that grim scene on that hillside as Rispa models that protective nature that is so wired into the life of a mother. Long after life is gone, long after hope is uh, there, she stays and she watches and she protects. There's something about a mother's love that is unending. It's almost illogical. <laughs> but it's the essence of what love will do. I like to think of family as a place where you can come and find rest and hope and safe harbor. Mothers are givers of hope. 
It's a quality that we often refer to as servanthood. The willingness simply to give. And therein is the blessing of motherhood. The sacrifice that gives all what it has for the sake of another. Uh, understand that you are never more like God than when you give. You're never more like Jesus than when you're willing to sacrifice for the need and love of another. The story of Rizpah does not end on that rain-drenched hillside. For we're told that David heard of the faithfulness of this mother and honored not only her sons, but the seven men who had died, as well as Saul and Jonathan, and provided them with an honorable birth, a burial. And then, and only then, did Rizpah find peace. My prayer for each mother who is here is that you would find an extra assurance of God's grace in all that you do for the sake of your children, for all that you do in the name of God and Christ in the work of their life, when you cannot dredge up the strength, may you find all the love you need in God, who said through Isaiah, he will never leave us. I would like to pray for mothers today. So if you're a mother... I'm going to invite you to stand right where you are, if you would. And let me take a moment to have a, a, a prayer over you and for you and with you. So mothers, those of you who are mothers. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we come this morning to give you thanks in our celebration of mothers, those who are here, who stand in our presence this day. They are a gift. You've created for the sake of our very humanity, the very real miracle of bringing a life into this world. With all the huge challenges associated with guiding the life of another, I pray that you would bless them in this vital and essential work. Strengthen weary hands and hearts. Heal brokenness. Pray, I pray, Father, for those mothers who carry on this work alone, without a companion to support and encourage. Our prayer for them is that you would provide them with grace enough for each day, strength enough for each challenge, love enough, even beyond that of the pre their precious child. We pray for those for whom this is a very hard day, for those whose mothers have had to embrace the fragility of life in loss and the absence of a child, including those who lost their children before birth. We also pray for those who recently lost their mothers and have no phone call to make and no place to send a card or flowers, and there is an absence that is almost tangible. For all of these, O oh Father, I pray that you will come alongside and wrap them up in your arms and bring them, their heart, close to you, that they might know your comfort. And Father, we know your word is true, your presence is real, your love is everlasting. We give you thanks for these who have taken up the great and wondrous challenge of motherhood. Bless them, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, mothers, for your servanthood. It is also my privilege today to lead you into a time of communion. This is a, an important uh, celebration and event in the life of the church. Now, I'll say this. I... I may not always wear a tie. <laughs> but on days when we're going to do communion, I feel like I do want to um, honor the presence of God. Not that he isn't here every time and with us all of the time. But somehow it seems to me just a, a right thing to do. Paul, in his writing to the Corinthians, stated this, for I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. 
The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Within the Church of the Nazarene, communion is open. What that means is you don't have to be a member here. You don't have to even attend on a regular basis. We ask, though, as you partake, that as you take these emblems and elements and share, as we share them together in commonness, that you will recognize you need to be one who confesses Christ as your Savior, uh, that you trust him, that he's forgiven your sins. And this is a celebration of that particular event. So we are going to distribute these elements, and I'm going to uh, uh, ask as they are passed that you would take them and hold on to them until we have received all of these. Let me pray a blessing for them. Father, I thank you for these, the emblems of this, the Last Supper, communion, the Eucharist, the meal of thanksgiving and celebration. Quicken them to our heart that we would acknowledge and recognize this wonderful great gift you've given to us of forgiveness and new life. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Now we invite you again to hold on to these elements until all have received. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. It represents his shed blood. And by it, we have the remission of sins. This is the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for you. Take and drink and do so in celebration of this great gift. Father, we do thank you indeed for reminding us of the truth of this. You are here, you are present, you are with us. So guide and direct, bless and be with your people. And thank you for this great gift. In Jesus' name, amen. That's from Hebrews. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back the dead are from our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good for doing his will. And may we work in us whatever is blessing to us through Jesus Christ, to whom glory be forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God bless you.